गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन माई स्लाइड विजिबल यस या सो थैंक्स डॉक्टर शांता फॉर द इन्विटेशन थैंक्स डॉक्टर नम्रता एंड डॉक्टर राजेश सिंह सो माई गोइंग going to be the first talk basically the opening batsman and i'll set up the meaning for the other speaker uh, my talk is glaucoma diagnosis beyond iop so you know if you know the definition of glaucoma it's a group of ocular disorders with multifactorial etiology and by definition they have a characteristic characteristic optic disc changes with the corresponding visual field defect where iop is the major contributing factor we must remember that iop is not the part component of glaucoma definition and if you look the various population based studies various rcts like emgt nearly 50% of the patients iop were less than 21 either at the time of diagnosis or at the time of enrollment in the study so if you go only by the iop criteria for the diagnosis of glaucoma then you are going to miss huge number of patients in the early stage you may pick up in the advanced stage because then patient will keep complaining about that they can't see but in the earlier stage you may miss them so we should not go by the iop only for the glaucoma diagnosis so as a ophthalmologist i am not talking about glaucoma specialists all of us as a ophthalmologist it is our job to make sure that we diagnose the glaucoma the type of glaucoma as i said is a multifactorial disease there are various types and subtypes so we diagnose the exact type of glaucoma we plan the medical treatment and we follow up the patients accordingly at the same time majority of our patients have a coexisting systemic disease and they may be on the multiple various systemic medication which can affect the glaucoma diagnosis as well as his management plan so we have to keep all this in account when we diagnose the glaucoma so what we need to do is to have a comprehensive eye examination before we do the examination on street lamp we have to have a detailed history external examination street lamp examination and patient tonometry when i said beyond iop i never meant that you know iop is not the part of the examination iop is must application tonometry tonioscopy dilated optic disc examination and if necessary investigation like perimetry and imaging corneal thickness i would say is necessary when we are talking about glaucoma in every patients so history you know there are certain um, important factors basically the steroid steroid is uh, used left right and center you know over the counter people can buy steroid drops so steroid use is something which we have to keep in mind the minor history of trauma also can lead to angle recession the systemic disease there are some drugs which can affect the glaucoma management plans like patient on systemic uh, blood uh, anti hypertensive beta blocker can mask the iop because 70% of iop reductions can happen patient taking systemic beta blocker patient on blood thinner because that affect the surgical plan so massive blood loss severe hypertension can have one time damage so all these things are very important the general examination like you know patient having the long slender build maybe marfanoid uh, short stubby well massageny and they have a very typical ocular features and may have secondary glaucoma so this give us a, a you know a fair amount of idea that what we need to look in individual patients then we go to the street lamp examination if the patient is dilated episcleral vein then we know that most probably patient have a increase episcleral venous pressure and may be the cause of the secondary glaucoma on other hand if the patient may some type patient may have forgotten to give the history but if you have a steroid depot then you know that increase the intraocular pressure is most probably because of the steroid depot on one hand if on the cornea if you have classic krukenbein swindle then you know the cause is pigment dispersion syndrome or pigmentary glaucoma on other hand if the patient has kps then the rise in iop may be because of the uvit is itself all the patient given steroid drops or systemic steroid for his uvit is so the examination help us in making the diagnosis pupil examination if the acute rise patient can have this kind of sphincter is uh, uh, atrophy the sphincter tear will lead you to diagnosis of uh, angle recession if you do proper uh, gonioscopy basically you need to look or moth return appearance will give you idea that patient is pseudo exfoliation so iris examination if you do a careful examination then you will pick up the cause that patient basically has new vascular glaucoma and not something else hmm? the this is the normal uh, exposed vessel but this is a new vessel so a careful examination will guide you 
into a proper diagnosis. As I said my, at the beginning of my talk, that IOP is not the criteria we need to use for diagnosis of glaucoma. But I never mentioned I want to reiterate IOP is very important because at this point in time, that's the only modifiable risk factor. So we have to check applanation tonometry. And I'm very clearly saying it should be applanation tonometry. The form of non contact tonometry or SHIO should not be used for glaucoma management. And IOP, we also need to remember that peak IOP, the fluctuation IOP is independent risk factor, and we need to look into it. So the studies have shown that the higher the diurnal fluctuation, the higher the risk. In fact, it is five to six times more compared to patient having low fluctuation. So IOP fluctuation is independent risk factor. Now, every patient do not require full diurnal or, or the mini diurnal curve. But what we can do in a routine practice, we check the pressure at different time of the day. So sometimes we call the patient in morning, sometime in afternoon, sometime in evening, and we get a fair amount of idea of this fluctuation. We also get an idea about his long-term peak the fluctuation. So this is how I use the IOP measurement in my clinic, and I would recommend that. When we're talking about IOP, Gordon thickness goes along with it. We know that the uh, apprehension tonometry has lots of limitation, and the corneal thickness is one of them. So every patient, especially when you are diagnosing ocular hypertension or normal tension glaucoma, please check corneal thickness. Make sure cornea is normal thickness. At the same time, I would uh, very strongly tell people that don't use nomogram to correct the IOP. That's not, not the right thing. Nomogram has lots of limitation. So what I would do, and I recommend people doing that, divide the corneal thickness into low, average, and thick cornea, and use that guideline in making your risk factor profile and decision plan. When it comes to Indian subcontinent, open angle glaucoma is diagnosis of exclusion. Every patient should have gonioscopy, especially when you're going to diagnose patient is glaucoma. Okay. And I recommend people doing indentation gonioscopy because you can make out very clearly what is happening on the amount of sinica you can make out more clearly on indentation gonioscopy. So every patient, every ophthalmologist should learn indentation gonioscopy and preferably do indentation gonioscopy in every patient, especially you diagnose glaucoma. So this was one patient at high IOP, central anterior chamber depth was normal, but in gonioscopy, patient is a classic, the bridge sinicia, which is characteristic for ER syndrome. Of course, this patient also had a detached colbus line, which is characteristic for PR syndrome. But when you do gonioscopy, you can find the cause and the types of glaucoma, which you miss otherwise, if you don't do gonioscopy or if you rely on something called you know, ASOCT. So every patient should have gonioscopy, ideally. But if you are too busy in private practice, if you don't have time for gonioscopy, then at least in all patients whose IOP is high, or one eric is less than one fourth, if they give history of trauma, if the disc is suspicious, if somebody has diagnosed glaucoma, patient has come for second opinion, UVITs, patient having diabetes, ischemic retinal diseases, they must have gonioscopy in every patient. When you dilate, look carefully the street time examination again, especially the lens, you may find the cause of uh, glaucoma, like this patient had a old glaucom flecon. So he had a history of acute angle closure, which was missed. This is pseudo exfoliation. This is microsphere of ICA. So you can find the cause of his glaucom. Now, after that, the most important examination in, as, when it comes to glaucoma is optic disc evolution, because by definition is optic disc and RNFL changes. So when you dilate the patient, you look optic disc and RNFL very carefully. Now it's very imperative that we do more careful examination. We want to pick up glaucoma in the earlier stage and not when it comes with bipolar notch and on phase glaucoma. And if you look at the uh, various studies, uh, it's been shown very clearly that the optic nerve and RNFL changes happens much before the visual field changes. So optic disc examination along with RNFL examination is very important. Straight lamp, 60D, 70D, 90D, contact lens use red free. Don't use indirect ophthalmoscope or direct ophthalmoscope for diagnosis of uh, optic disc changes. When you do a stereo examination, the contour of rim examination is very important. You get an uh, a indirect clue from the blood vessels and color. I may not able to explain you very clearly on this is monoscopic photograph. When you do a stereo examination, these clues gives you idea about the cup and rim, uh, the way the vessels are bending, the way vessels are coming forward, and you use that clue to diagnose the differentiated cup and rim, not the color. The documentation, this drawing, of course, if you have photographs and photography, Imaging, imaging gives you a different idea. Not they are not same, same as discrimination, but of course it helps us in clinical practice. 
there were lots of changes and i'm not going to talk all about it but as i mentioned earlier that we have a habit of doing checking only iop for diagnosis of glaucoma we have a habit of only doing cup disc ratio for diagnosis of glaucomatous disc changes so please don't do that because cup disc ratio is huge variability and the cup the disc ratio cdr is directly in relation to the disc size so basically around 1.2 million exon passes from the each disc the scan the canal as it varies the disc size varies and if the disc size varies and the number of fibers remain same the cup size would vary you know it's just a, a simple logic the left over space is cup the, the peripheral fibers form the rim the central left over space forms the cup now if you have a small disc then left over space is very small the cup is small on other hand if you have a huge big disc then left over space is big and big cup but this is normal physiological so the cup disc ratio varies according to the disc size so if you use only cdr for the diagnosis of glaucoma you are going to miss glaucoma if the disc is small and if you going to over diagnose glaucoma if the disc is large so please refrain from that cup disc ratio is directly relation to the disc size yes but cdr has value if the patient has very small cup disc ratio which increased over a period of time there is a definite sign of glaucoma and second if the two disc is similar and the cup disc ratio is different you can see here this is small cup disc ratio this is big both, both disc is right and left is similar so this cup disc ratio is more of course this is near near notch also but this cup disc is asymmetry is definitely a sign of glaucoma so that you must remember the neuro rim the rim examination is very important the isnt rule basically that inferior rim is thicker than superior which is thicker than nasal which is thicker than temporal which is followed mostly in 85% of the patients so just follow the isnt rule isnt will give you very good idea the basically the rim the isnt rule uh, the second is notch you can see here this inferior the rim is lost this is called the notch the localized notch so this is the thing you look in the neurological rim the third thing is the contour this is the normal contour the cross sectional area i have shown this is the cross sectional area which is normal in the early glaucoma we have a saturation inferior rim is thinned out you can see this is sloppy this is a saturation of disc which happens in early glaucoma as the damage increases you see that the saturation the loss has started going close to the rim but still the notch is not formed in this stage this patient of course has nfa loss but this in this stage the disc patient may have field defect may not have field defect so this examination will give you diagnosis glaucoma in earlier stage then patient is definitely the fiber is lost till the age of the disc this is the notch this is superior also this is disc hemorrhage also so the contour examination is very important then the disc hemorrhage disc hemorrhage is very specific to glaucoma patient doesn't have any other systemic disorder close to the rim and they may precede the nerve fiber loss the other circumlinear vessels if 50% patient may ha uh, have uh, vessels and if there is a bearing of vessel this again is a sign of early glaucoma you can see here this is the circumlinear vessel which is very tightly hugging the rim you can see this is the bearing of the vessel this is early glaucoma parapapillary atrophy beta zone is very specific which is close to the disc sign of glaucoma the rnfl now rnfl examination red free light you have to use and rnfl examination again is very important in early glaucoma you can see this is wedge shaped defect spanning out it the as it goes away from the disc it become bigger it touches the disc this is the wedge shaped rnfl defect which is specific for the glaucoma they are usually bigger than the vessels this is much bigger but the, it is bigger than the vessel size and is specific uh, and this is seen in the early glaucoma as the disc progresses the wedge shaped defect disappears because there would be diffuse rnfl loss but in early glaucoma you see a wedge shaped defect and you see this patient as a wedge shaped rnfl defect and is just beginning of the nasal step so the optic disc changes are more pronounced as visual field changes which usually happens in early glaucoma myopia differentiation is difficult so you should have a very high index of suspicion in myopic disc and myopia has relation with glaucoma so you have to examine optic disc very carefully there were huge differential diagnosis i am not going to talk about it but if the pallor is out of proportion then is most probably neurological you can see here this is respecting the vertical meridian this is a neurological field defect on other hand 
this is a congenital anomaly morning glory patient may have field defect may not have field defect but that would be stationary so don't diagnose this glaucoma this is a congenital anomaly and when you do a dilated examination look retina also you find out this patient had a inferior arcuate was diagnosed glaucoma but it didn't have glaucoma it was a, a superior brvo causing the field defect so you find out the cause of his field defect also so in conclusion of the disc examination you have to look this size cup disc ratio the rim examination is very important rnfl hemorrhage and peripapillary atrophy so to conclude the history a complete examination that include external examination straight line examination iop gonioscopy dilated optic disc examination document them properly and once you diagnose glaucoma counseling is important but that manish and murli will talk in more detail i am not going to talk about it thank you